Hey everyone, thanks for coming out. Uh, today we welcome Joel Stein. Uh, <laughs> Is that weird? Is that not what people do? I haven't done this that many times. <laughs> you might know Joel from uh, his Sitting here. in Time Magazine. <laughs> uh, also, he's the guy right over there. Uh, also from uh, various TV shows where he, you know, right after this, he'll be going to MSNBC to discuss about important things, I'm sure. With an uh, audience his about this. man made. He will teach us about being manly as, uh, you know, someone who grew up reading books and play with computers probably needs to learn more about. So, Joel Stein. This is, no, I already did that for you. Um, this may be the only group on the planet I could teach something about being manly to. So yeah, this will work out well. I, uh, I write for Time Magazine. I cover, the only beat I cover is myself because it's the only thing I'm interested in and no one was covering that beat. I got there in 1997. Um, I was writing for a magazine called Time Out New York and this editor at Time uh, asked me to write a piece for this quarterly that they did called Time Digital, back when people, like the internet was new and people were excited about it and you had a lot more magazines like Red Herring and Business 2.0. And so I went to, um, went to Kansas City and Minneapolis to find the world's greatest video game player. And I'd never been on a business trip before. I was like barely old enough to rent a car, which they make impossible until you're like 30 for some reason. And uh, I remember sitting in my hotel room having to write it that night, it was due the next day, and just freaking out, like writing for anything that Time Magazine put out seemed so scary. And I was just panicked and I couldn't write and I drove around uh, Minneapolis for a while and I got to a steak and shake. And I just I drove in, I was just gonna get an iced tea or something, and I uh, went up to the drive through box and the woman said, can I help you? And I said, yeah, I, I just really wanna talk. And <laughs> And she said, okay. And so I told her my problems. I had the story to write, it's for Time Magazine. And I, I keep picturing four million people reading it. And, and she gave me the most amazing pep talk, which was like, they wouldn't have hired you if they didn't think you could do it. Like, you've done this before. Like, don't, don't get in your head so much. And it was so incredibly helpful. And I drove up and I, uh, I we didn't have the connection I kind of hoped we'd have. You know, it's, it's one thing when you're talking to someone through a box and you see, I thought she'd be my future wife. And it, it didn't work out. But I did go home and I wrote it. I went to the hotel and I wrote it. And uh, uh, a couple months later, I got hired by Time Magazine, which uh, freaked me out because I thought I'd have to write super boring stuff for the rest of my life. But they were paying me in real money instead of in food, which is what I was getting paid at Time Out in New York. Which I think you get paid, do they pay you in food or do they also give you a salary here? Because I would do it just for the food. But that's why I'm a journalist and you guys are engineers. Um, and then, so I've been working at Time since 97, and what I've found is that the best way for me to learn things is by doing things. So um, when I write about something, e even if it doesn't go in the article, even if the article is all in third person, uh, I usually go do something to understand it. Like I recently wrote a profile of Steve Ells, who, uh, the CEO of Chipotle, and I kind of thought I got him, I thought I got the company, but then I let, they got the company to let me work at Chipotle for half a day. Uh, and then I, I kind of really got what they were telling me. And it's really hard for me, uh, although I did fine in school, to learn any other way. So that's kind of how I got to writing this book. Uh, and kind of how I do most of my stories in time. Like I had to do a cover on uh, George Clooney. And I didn't know, like sitting down with him seemed so boring. So I invited him over to my house for dinner thinking he would say no, but just would buy me time to think of more interesting things. And he said yes, and uh, at which point I had to tell my wife that George Clooney was coming over for dinner, <laughs> which if anyone has a normal wife and a normal relationship, I forgot this is on YouTube. If anyone has uh, a wife who occasionally Googles her husband, my wife doesn't care, this is fine. Uh, yeah, she was pissed. She was like, I have to clean the house and make like, a playlist, like you're cleaning it and you're making dinner. I'm like, yeah, of course, of course. So uh, she, she got drunk and uh, so did George Clooney and she spent a half hour just grilling him on why he doesn't have a wife, which uh, I was so happy about. I was just taking crazy notes. <laughs> and uh, didn't make it in the piece. My editor kept cutting it. I kept putting it back in. My editor kept cutting it. Um, but yeah, so he, uh, 
there is video. I find that like the things I do, uh, because some of them, I think because journalists lie all the time. People assume that I'm lying. Uh, so I've taken to, sh to, if I can remember, it's easier now when I have my Google Android phone in my pocket. Um, I shoot video whenever I can. Like when Clooney was over, uh, this alarm started going off. And I just figured I'd ignore it because that's what I do when alarms go off. And he had been a, a handyman. And he's like, no, we're gonna, we're gonna fix this. Like let's figure out where this alarm's coming from. Uh, so he wound up looking all over my house. He went under my house and got this ladder. Uh, and way under my house, I live in the hills. And then he brought it and went into uh, my attic, which I now call the Clooney attic, because <laughs> I've never been in there. So I still haven't been in there. And he went up there with a flashlight, a little bit drunk. And so I, I videotaped all this. It turned out it was uh, under our table was a uh, monoxide alarm. Uh, it just needed a new battery, which we figured out eventually. We would have got there much earlier if we hadn't been drinking. But the uh, I videotaped it, and now people who read this, people who read the story, I don't think believed he was in my attic. But you see the video. So for the book, I tried to videotape as much of me getting beat up as I could, so that people would believe it. Uh, so for the book, I found out, you know, my wife was pregnant, and we were going to the first sonogram where we could probably tell if it was a boy or a girl. And I remember thinking that uh, I don't care if it's a boy or a girl. I am, uh, you know, I'm a child of the 70s. I understand uh, both genders are lovely. I've enjoyed both, the, that's weird to say. I, uh, <laughs> totally straight. I couldn't be more straight. I have, do I find some men attractive? Sure, we all do. But I've never gotten to second base with a guy, ever. Leave it there. So I, uh, so I thought I didn't care, went to get the sonogram, and uh, they told us that uh, our son was a, a boy. In fact, our, our OBGYN, who I will not, I will not name, uh, is amazing, super cool, super smart woman, went to Princeton, um, uh, just uh, super smart. But when she gave us the, um, when you go to a sonogram now, you get the equivalent of like a photo booth strip of pictures of your child. And um, she said to us, it's a boy, wow, he's got a really big penis. If he uh, ever, if things don't work out with him, for him in school, he can always work in the valley. <laughs> and like, this is all so weird, I'm just processing information. She gives us this photo strip, she draws like a penis and testicles, and writes wow, exclamation point next to it. And, um, and all I'm thinking is, we, we need a new OBGYN, I'm sure. <laughs> But I'm also having like a mini panic attack where I'm freaking out because I'm picturing, all I can picture is that penis and that, uh, you know, that penis wanting to throw a baseball and that penis wanting to go camping and that penis getting in a fight and needing to have a fight. And I'm like, I'm not capable of any of that stuff. Like I, when I was a kid, all my friends were girls. I listened to nothing but show tunes until I was like 13. Um, I had a glass animal collection. I had an easy bake oven. Um, which I still think is awesome, because you can make cakes in your room. I don't see it, but, but a lot of other boys didn't. And I, uh, I never went camping, I never played Little League. I, I just thought, my son's gonna wanna do all this stuff and I'm not gonna be able to. So I went out and tried to learn all the things I should have learned long before this. So I started out, I went on a series of what I call man ventures. And the first thing I did was I figured I'd fix the first problem, which was not becoming a Boy Scout. So I called the Boy Scouts, and they said I could indeed uh, earn my first badge. And so I went on a camping trip for a weekend with 11-year-old uh, Boy Scouts and put up my first tent and slept in it. And I, where I learned uh, the difference between sleeping in a tent and sleeping just not in a tent is, doesn't exist. I don't know who the tent industry has fooled, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's still cold. It's still it's wet when you lay. I, I, uh, I, I, either had the wrong tent or everyone else is an idiot. And then I, so I went on a bunch of these adventures. I, let's see, I did so many things that I've blocked out of my head because they were painful. I got a day trader to give me $100,000 to day trade with of his money for a day in Chicago. I uh, worked in the pit crew of a, of a racing team, an American Le Mans racing team. I had a Lamborghini 
super legera for three days, which uh, was incredibly fun. I helped my very manly father-in-law fix a house, re-roof, and do some plumbing work in a house for three days. Um, I went turkey hunting. <clears throat> Have any of you ever gone turkey hunting? I'm at Google, I'm asking silly questions. <laughs> Have any of you ever played a video game in which turkey hunting takes place? Duck hunt, that's close, that's the, yeah. I too have played duck hunt. Turkey hunting is totally different than duck hunt. Turkey hunting, so I had this crush on a girl from kindergarten to fifth grade uh, named Busy Sklars, a uh, very worthwhile crush. And in fact, nothing to do with the story, just want to brag, after college, kissed her at a bar. <laughs> bar called the Village Idiot. Only time I've ever kissed a woman at a bar. Village Idiot, closed now. Yeah, I think it was owned by the same people that owned Coyote Ugly, perhaps. Um, yeah. But anyway, I kissed Busy Sklars there. Uh, wrote it on the wall. Didn't write it on the wall. Wrote it in my book. And uh, so Busy did not wind up marrying me. Uh, she wound up marrying a very manly dude up in Vermont who uh, built, <coughs> built the extension on the log cabin they live in by chopping down the trees in his backyard himself and like putting the logs in. And his house is just uh, dead animals on the wall that he's killed. And I, I remember I walked into their house. I'd never been up there before. And uh, so I came up to go turkey hunting with him. And there were, there were like three deer on the wall. And I was like, oh, you killed them all? He's like, yeah, I wanted one that I shot with, uh, you know, with a rifle, one I shot with a uh, muzzle loader, and one I shot with a crossbow. I was like, I don't want to do this. <laughs> and I had to, you, to go hunting, I, I'm pretty socially liberal, and to go hunting, turns out you have to pass a test and get a license. It's like a 12-hour class, and you take a test. And I was like, I'm just going hunting for one day with a trained guide. I still have to take this test. And they looked at me like I was crazy when I called, or they said I was crazy. Of course you have to take a test. You're going to have a gun in your hands. And I just, I had moved further right than the NRA in about five minutes of wanting to go hunting <laughs> than I ever thought I could possibly move. So uh, turkey hunting, just in case anyone ever invites you, don't go. It, you have to wake up. <laughs> Like with all male activities, you have to wake up at like 4 a.m. Like I don't know, because guys go and play like poker at night and go to strip clubs. Like guys are out until 2 and they wake up at 4. Like sleeping is not manly, was the first lesson I learned. And for turkey hunting, uh, it turns out I don't like animals enough to kill them because you have to get really involved in animal life. Like to kill a turkey, you have to go out in the woods, hide, not move, wear camouflage, and pretend you're a female turkey who desperately wants to get laid. So you have to learn like what a sexy turkey would sound like, uh, how to determine other actual female sexy turkeys and, and get in like, arguments with them that you're going to be a better turkey blowjob giver to your <laughs> turkey man. And turkeys don't feel, I, I think eating meat is wrong, except for turkey, because turkeys are the worst people in the world. Turkeys, this is what, honestly, this is what a male turkey does in the morning. He uh, goes out, has sex with as many females as he can, and as soon as a, a less alpha turkey comes along, he beats him up and makes him stand there and watch. That's what, and during mating season, that's a turkey morning. They just have sex until, the, uh, quote unquote, from my Matt, Busy's husband, they have, quote, they have sex until their peckers hurt. That's their morning. So we went out, and Matt, Sat, I hold, held the gun, and Matt sat next to me and tried to be a sexy turkey, and he gets really into it, like making sexy turkey faces. And I just thought, this is, I'm not, I'm not manly enough to even be comfortable with what's going on. Uh, and after turkey hunting, I um, went, I got the, so I figured I had to do something military related. And I thought about embedding in Iraq. And my wife thought about me not embedding in Iraq. And I didn't want to embed in Iraq. So I called. And I thought that when you embed, you kind of just watch. Anyway, I wanted to do something more experiential. So I called someone at the Department of Defense. And I said, uh, would any of the branches let me do like three days of boot camp somewhere? And the next thing I know, every branch of the military was emailing me better and better offers to compete, to have me use up our nation's resources. And so. It got crazier and crazier. I was going to do something. I did do something with the Marines. I was talking to the Navy, the Army. This general, Mark Hurtling, general, started emailing me, uh, and it, it jokes. 
he started emailing me like, uh, I heard you're talking to the Navy. I thought you wanted to learn how to be a real man. <laughs> Smiley face. <laughs> and I was like, I want to be in the branch of the military where the generals use emoticons. Like, that's, that's my branch. So I did some stuff in the Marines, but the real stuff I did was with the Army. And um, again, rhetorical question, have any of you served in the military? Uh, really? What did you do? Uh, Air Force. Well, how long were you in the Air Force? Uh, I was with him for six years, but I was in for a year uh, right after the original Gulf War. And then there was a big reduction in force, and I was probably like that. So do you, do you have a job here? You just take people's lunch money? What do you do? <laughs> That's what I do, generally. Yeah, because they don't need it. <laughs> they probably don't mind. <laughs> wow. Um, did you all know that? I figured that would be something everyone at Google knew that someone served. He will protect you when things go badly here. <laughs> so uh, boot camp is uh, really stressful. Like, they yell at you all the time. Like, you, when you eat, you can't look up. And if you look up, they yell at you. You don't talk to each other. They, um, this is true in the Marines, but it's also true in the Army. I, went to go do this swimming test at the Marines, and they made me take off my clothes, which was weird because they were dressed, and uh, then they made me walk through these very bottom bottom kind of showers that I had to walk through, and then they made me urinate, and this guy stood and yelled in my ear and counted down from 30 while I, while I urinated, uh, and I was like, oh, they yell at you while you piss, like that's stressful, <laughs> and then he got to zero, and I didn't know what to do because I still had a good stream going, and, uh, and he just started counting again from 10. So I don't know what the consequences were, but it was scary as shit. Like, I was just someone <laughs> screaming in your ear while you piss. And basically, it's just getting screamed at constantly because everything you do is wrong. So uh, I, had been, I had only been in, the, in my fake boot camp. They let me do it with a real troop, and they uh, let me. That was kind of real, but I knew I could leave at any time. And I was 39 years old. I wasn't like away from home for my first time. But it was really stressful, even in my, like the way that um, a haunted house is stressful, even though it's fake, it still feels real because someone's really yelling at you. And so I'm stalling telling you the fact that uh, I was only three hours in. I hadn't done any physical activity. Uh, it was super hot. And I, I hadn't really slept because I was nervous the night before. And uh, I, they made me eat this like uh, cold MRE. Uh, I fainted. Uh, three hours in without having done any physical activity. I've never fainted before, never fainted after. It was, but if, you, if any of you go into the military, my advice is faint right away, because the tenor changes immediately. I had a Pedialyte and a fan and a doctor, and uh, I was treated, throughout the whole experience, I was treated a little bit better. So yeah, even like there's this thing called the night infiltration course, which is amazing. They wait until it gets dark out. So you're just waiting and waiting. And then they have these speakers that blast the Muslim call to prayers, uh, which if you're in a US military uniform, I don't care if you are Muslim, it's the scariest thing in the world. And then they play uh, women and children screaming. Uh, and then they make you get into a low crawl and crawl towards these towers that are shooting actual live um, machine gun fire right over your head uh, and you, so you don't stand up. Um, you keep crawling, and it's, it was the most, one of the most amazing things I've done in my life because um, I'm not a very focused person. I don't, as you know, don't play sports, but when people are shooting live real machine gun fire over your head, you really are in the moment. Like, and every so often they, sh they fire a uh, flare, and the idea was you had to stay completely still so that you wouldn't be seen by the enemy, which is actually some private somewhere shooting machine gun at you. Uh, and the sky lights up and you have to stay still. And it's really, it was one of the oddly most peaceful moments of my life because I was, there was nowhere else I could possibly be or think to be and it was amazing. And I got to the end uh, where you're supposed to stand up and I didn't stand up, I kept going. But eventually I stood up. I was kind of proud of myself. I had done it, I mean I'd survived and done like a, a decent job of like telling other people to go away from these TNT areas that were exploding near us. And uh, they were fenced off, but still loud. And I got to the end, and these, uh, these people came over to me, and they're like, uh, they're doctors. They're like, are you OK? We heard you fainted earlier today. <laughs> and I realized that 
if I ever was in the military, that's all I'd be known for for my entire career, which, you know, I'd be like, I'd be carrying POWs over my shoulders and uh, they'd be barely alive and mocking me for being the guy that fainted during boot camp. <laughs> so the military's out for me. And then finally, I, uh, I decided part of my problem was I'm afraid of confrontation. So I decided that I really being afraid of confrontation taken to extreme is being afraid of getting in a fight. So I decided I needed to get in a fight. And I didn't know how to do that. Do you like go to a bar and insult someone's woman? Like I had no idea how to get into a fight. So I did what all wimpy guys do, uh, journalists at least, when they want to do something is I called a publicist. And I called the publicist for the UFC and I said, I would like to fight one of your fighters knowing they'd say no because they have lawyers and uh, uh, they don't make you sign NDAs as soon as you walk into a room, but they do have lawyers. And the guy, the, other, the publicist said, that's a great idea. Uh, we will let you fight Randy Couture. And I Googled Randy Couture and I thought, this is not a good idea at all. <laughs> and I went to, I couldn't back out though, because the whole point was I was afraid of confrontation, so backing out seemed like a horrible idea. So I went and trained with Dana White, who's the president of the UFC, and he set up some training for me. And one of the, one of the things he did was that uh, I did videotape so that people can believe it, is uh, he had this jujitsu black belt uh, guy with me. And he said, the first thing I want you to do, dude, you got to get choked out. And so I said, uh, I, don't, I just want to learn how to defend myself. I don't know if I have to experience the worst of it. He's like, dude, you got to know what it's like to get choked out. So we had uh, this guy take off his shirt, oddly, and get behind me <laughs> and, uh, as if this wasn't gay enough and choke me out. And, um, and he had never choked out a total pussy before. So he didn't know that like, I would immediately in this situation, instead of trying to fight him, which I knew was useless, I just wanted to get it over with. So I tried to go to sleep. And uh, you know, I was just trying to help. And, <laughs> and I am an awesome actor, apparently. And they thought I'd fall asleep. And the next thing I know, Dana White is yelling in my face, dude, did you dream? I was like, did I dream? He's like, yeah, you dream, it's crazy. I don't think you were choked out, let's do it again. So I was like, no, no, no. And the, the, the guy chokes me out again. And again, I fake sleeping. And again, he's fooled. And, and my voice, and my throat is so sore. Like that night, I, I couldn't swallow my own spit. I, uh, I, know, I knew, now I know why men for eons have been such dicks. Because if you have a really miserable, hard, physical day, I, I couldn't talk, I couldn't smile. I was just an uh, uh, unhappy zombie, which is how I imagine like, men come home from like, mining as. And, uh, the next, and my wife was like, you can't, this is the day before I was supposed to fight Randy Couture, and she's like, you can't do that tomorrow. Like, part of being a man is knowing when to quit. And I was, I, was, I was in enough of a daze where I was like, yeah, that makes sense. Like, anything you say right now would make sense. Like, being a man is, knowing how to arrange flowers. Like anything would have made sense. <laughs> and so I woke up the next morning and this like fog had kind of lifted. My throat still killed, but I like was able to let it function. So I went and I fought Randy Couture and I thought I, I met him thinking uh, I would charm him and then he would know not to hurt me. <laughs> but uh, but he, he would not talk to me. He was like pointed and like we went to this ring and I was so, so scared. But I was, I was hoping it would be over in like five seconds he would either hit me and I would black out, or he would get me into some kind of hold and I, and I would end. But instead, Randy Couture decided to go at like 10% and let me know what five minutes in the ring felt like. And he would just toy with me and kind of knock me down, then let me go, and knock me down, let me go. And uh, I, I don't recommend this as an experience. Uh, <laughs> but kind of after doing all this stuff, I, I, I realized that there's a lot of it I didn't like. And that genetically, there's just some stuff I'm predisposed not to like. Uh, I don't have the kind of detail and the attention span for some of the stuff. Like, I do fix stuff around my house now because uh, really minor stuff that I YouTube, and you can, it's so much easier than you, some of it's so much easier than you think, and it impresses my wife, and it gets me laid. So like, if fixing a toilet will get me laid and it takes a half hour, I will fix a toilet. And it does make you feel good about yourself because it's like, first of all, it's faster than calling someone and standing around and pretending to watch him do it. And uh, it's cheaper, and it does make you feel connected to your home in a different way. 
But during this whole time uh, that I was doing this, I also was making this list for my son of advice that I had, things I had, I had experienced, things people had said to me. And uh, in the end, what I'd learned from doing this book is that kind of what I learned from writing my column in Time Magazine, which is that the only real way to change is by doing stuff. And I, I've become like 10% manlier. Like if I kept doing this stuff, I think I would really change, uh, but I've been lazy. And so, and so I, uh, I thought about this list and I just, in the end, it's, it's a really good list and I'm really proud of it. But in the end, I decided not to give it to him because the only way uh, a man learns is by, is by doing, not by reading. So uh, I don't think you'll ever see that list. Uh, but I'll, I'll put it up on the line. I don't care. Uh, is there anything I could possibly tell you about either uh, my job, my uh, book, or uh, my sex life? <laughs> my use of Google to improve my sex life? So uh, in your experiences through the book... Um, Mohawks, no, not manly. Is that the question? <laughs> what, what was the most physically demanding, and what was the most mentally demanding? The, the army was by far the most mentally demanding. It wasn't even close. The most physically demanding, you know, the Army wasn't, you know, the Army boot camp, the Marine boot camp was a tiny bit harder, but even the Marine boot camp, I was an old man doing stuff meant for young men, and I passed everything. I'm not, I can't even really swim, and I got to level three of the Marine swimming test out of, uh, I think, four, uh, without knowing what it was or trying. The, the Army stuff was like, for the most part, some of it was very hard, but for the most part, it's like three hard workouts a day, but that, that's all you're doing, really. Um, so I didn't find that too demanding. The, the uh, MMA stuff, the UFC fighting stuff, was really physically demanding, especially the jujitsu. But the boxing and the Muay Thai, the kickboxing was really demanding. But the MMA stuff, like if I, I think about going to take some MMA classes to get in better shape, uh, it's an amazing workout. Thank you. Anyone else have workout questions? <laughs> yeah, me for sure. Okay, no, you um, look great. I have two questions. Sure. Uh, the first is, is, is really interesting when you're talking about your experience in the Army at night and how they play the call to prayer, which I didn't know about. So why do they do that? Oh, um, America hates Muslims. <laughs> and uh, we express it wherever we can. I don't know if you've noticed this. Uh, why do they play the, you know, they try over and over again, they try and replicate the current battles that were going on. So I can't, they have a whole fake village. Both the, the Marines and the Army have fake, back then, fake Iraqi villages where they hired like local uh, Arabs to, to play like the bad guys. Oh, wow. So yeah, like the thing about the Army that I didn't like was it's like you're constantly reminded that the job is killing people. And for me, that's a deal breaker. <laughs> like if I had gotten to time and they had said, you get to write about yourself. You have an expense account. Uh, we're going to pay you well. But you got to kill people. I wouldn't have taken the job. So for me, it was a constant reminder that we're killing people. I didn't feel like they were racist or homophobic at all. In fact, they, I thought they were very careful um, about it. But they were clear about who the enemy was. And, and that has involves the call to prayers, which is, I was surprised about, which is why I mentioned it why I wrote about it. Um, yeah, it was, you should, you should be warned. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. No problem. Um, and my second <coughs> question was, what if your son is like you and he likes show tunes? And like well, my son does like show tunes because I play them all the time. <laughs> and he already can sing Singing in the Rain in these three. So about halfway through the book, I went from thinking, oh my god, what if my son wants to do this stuff? I better know how, because he does. He already, I can tell he wants to go camping. So now I can at least set up a tent and take him camping and not be afraid. But I also started thinking halfway through, oh my god, I don't want to raise another me. I don't want a kid who's afraid of everything. I don't need him to like all this stuff, but I want him to at least experience it so he knows that he has more capabilities than he thinks and that the world isn't as uh, bifurcated or, or divided. and things aren't as scary as he thinks. So I want him to experience things even if he doesn't want to. I know you can't force a kid to do things. That's part of what I learned in the book. But uh, yes, my son is very much like me. He's a total non-confrontational wimp. He hates sports or throwing a ball or whatever the equivalent is now. But he loves cars and trucks. 
So every kid's totally different, and I've had to learn about. I know I knew nothing about cars and trucks, and now I know uh, as much as a three-year-old about cars and trucks. So it's a huge improvement. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Like so your book was about masculinity. Um, did it? Did you get any insights about femininity from? Oh, I had lots of insight. If I had a girl, this would be easy. Did I get any extra insights about femininity? Yeah, like um, it's the same lesson I've been learning my whole life, which is that uh, as much as they say they don't, women like want someone who has some capabilities and confidence. And the stuff I do in the book is stuff that like any woman can and should do, and would get. Uh, accolades for in our society for being able to fix a house, being able to protect herself. Like, these aren't particularly male skills, but as a guy, if you don't have those skills, you're harshly judged. Where if, as if you're a woman without those skills, society kind of accepts that. And that's the lesson I kept learning, that like, if you don't know how to fix stuff around your house, as much as your wife and other women don't care, they care. And if you can't protect them like, and you protect yourself, they care. And, it, and that erodes your confidence a little bit. So like there's no, I grew up in the 70s, I listened to Be Free to Be You and Me over and over again. Like uh, I was taught that there's no difference between boys and girls, and it's a societal construct. But gender is not a societal construct. Because my son came out, like he could barely crawl, and he started pushing around mustard on the ground and making noises. And we're like, oh, I guess we should buy him a toy car. And that's all he cares about, is cars. And we were just at like our preschool open house, and they talked about like, you can put stuff in their cubby, there was something that like, don't bring chapstick because all the girls wind up just using the chapstick and fighting over it. And I was like, why do they come out so differently? Like, I, you must know the answer, right? Isn't there some Google brain scan that's being done on? Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. We'll share that with us at some point. And we'll, it's, we'll, it is Google brain scan, in fact. Google brain scan, is that the, OK. That's, how far do I have to scroll down the menu to get to that? Because there's 8,000 things. Like, streamline, isn't that the whole point? It's just a bar? It's like, oh, we do that. We have cars that drive themselves. You just have to go to the fifth page. I'm like, you just passed to pass Google Plus eight times to get to anything. I have, by the way, 112 friends, which I think is the record on Google Plus. So you should friend me immediately. All right. From your insights and experience with this, what does it mean to be a man? Um, surfing is important to being a man. Uh, <laughs> smoking marijuana is important. Owning a van, having a dog named Scooby. Uh, have I nailed any of your life so far? <laughs> uh, what does it mean to be mad? I, I, the, the, most, the thing I learned the most was uh, having not just self-confidence, but uh, having some, some abilities and uh, I feel like I'm, in a, I'm this close to saying the, uh, who's the guy who keeps talking about skills? The indie movie, the kid from Utah? Yeah, Napoleon Dynamite. I feel like I was this close to being Napoleon Dynamite and talking about needing skills and fighting ligers and stuff. But uh, no, I think, I think self-confidence and, and capabilities uh, is, is very masculine and very attractive. And uh, I'd like to see you work on that. <laughs> also, computer science, programming, very manly. Engineering. How did you find out you wanted to be a comedy or humor writer? And what was it like in the early years of your career? Um, you know, I don't play an instrument. I'm not good at sports. Uh, there, there were very few options for me to get attention. And I think I developed a sense of humor. First of all, I'm Jewish. And so uh, that's kind of the mode of communication. So I was, and my parents think they're funny uh, and don't use YouTube, so I can say that. And, um, those, and I just was impressed by the, there was a, a, a punkishness to comedy that really appealed to me, because it wasn't the angry punkishness of like punk rock, but it was, uh, it was kind of an inside, you know, self-aware kind of flipping off the man, and that really appealed to me. So I was obsessed with Letterman. I subscribed to Spy, Spy Magazine. Letterman read one of my questions on air when I was in high school, which is the, is the highlight of my writing career. Um, I tried like seven times until I figured out how to get a letter on Letterman. And I, uh, so I, I didn't really think of it as a career. I thought I'd be a lawyer. 
because uh, that's all I can think of what people who don't have skills do. <laughs> and so I wrote for my high school paper. I wrote a column. I wrote a column for my college paper that was far more popular than my column is now. And I interned at Newsweek because some professor at Stanford who read my stuff in the school paper got me an internship there. And, and then it started to look more feasible. I gave myself two years before law school out of college. And uh, when those two years ended, and I was still fact checking uh, and not writing, I decided to give myself another two years. And uh, I was going to move to LA and try sitcom writing. That was my next two years. I'm sure I would have found out another two years until I died. And eventually becoming some kind of you know, a sonnet writer. But instead, uh, this new magazine, Time Out New York, started. And a guy I knew from working at Martha Stewart got a job there and got me an interview. Uh, for those first, I mean, it was only two years. And to struggle for two years in today's economy or even in the early 90s is amazing. But if you don't know it's two years, it seems kind of endless. And uh, it was hard. It was hard. To, and I started as a, not as a humor writer, I started as a journalist. And I tried to keep getting people to run my column. And I got time out to run it. And then when I got the time, I kept running the time out column. And then eventually, the editor of time, I, I thought the world was much smaller than it. Even before, before the internet, it was even easier to believe that the world was tiny. So I believed that the old people who worked at Time would never see my column in Time Out New York, uh, which was incredibly stupid. And of course they did. Uh, and I didn't get in trouble. And instead, they, Walter Isaacson, who was my boss, offered to run my column in Time. And I just remember like one of those moments where I guess your adrenaline gets going, and you see the world kind of like sharpens and shrinks. And I remember just like, this is crazy. And then so I've basically been writing a column since 1997 for Time. Uh, uh, it's been, I th I th people think I would get bored of it, but instead the readers get bored. But I keep, ha I keep having to find new readers uh, who don't get bored. So I still really like it. I don't think I answered any of your questions, but I got to talk about me. So <laughs> I had a good time. Um, through all the main ventures you've gone on, have any of them kind of stuck as, as hobbies? Well, I do s hobbies, no. And all men have hobbies. I don't have any hobbies. I remember sitting down at the cafeteria at Fort Knox, which is where Stripes was shot, and I did my fainting with the Army. And guys, what I also learned from writing this book is that I can now talk to guys in the military. Like, if I see a guy at the airport, if I saw a guy in uniform at the airport, I never knew what to do. Like, I didn't know. Like, do you thank him, or is that make you, that just annoys them, or do you like offer them your seat, or is that treating them like an old person? Like, I never knew how to deal, and now I just like talk to them about where they did boot camp and like talk about boot camp stuff, and talk about the army. Let me fire a tank, so I'm the first civilian to ever fire a tank, and the last civilian who will ever fire a tank. <laughs> so I can talk to them about tanks now. Um, so. Um, what was your question again? <laughs> I'm so excited to talk about myself. Uh, just if, any, if you, you're still doing oh, right. any of these things. So I, I fix some stuff around my house, but I don't have a hobby. These guys asked me uh, if I had a hobby, because they just wanted to connect. Mm -hmm. Like, the amazing thing about, no matter how different you are from other people, if you find like one tiny thing about their life that you're interested in, people are happy to talk to you no matter how different you are. So the guy just wanted to bond with me. He was like, do you have any hobbies? I was like, I don't. He's like, of course you have a hobby. He's like, I race cars and you know, uh, fix jet skis or whatever he did. And he had like 10 of them. And I was like, how do people have hobbies? Like, I'm, I'm either writing, like cooking dinner, or watching my kid, like, um, or looking at internet porn. Is that a hobby? And he said, no, that wasn't a hobby. So I, I'm out. Like, I, I fix stuff around my house. And, and when I say that, I mean like once every two months, I fix something. Uh, it's a small thing. So, that kind of stuck. Um, not, not a lot. Of, you know, my interest in cars stuck, but that's only because my son. So I've learned a lot more about cars, gotten more interested in them. But no, not a lot of it stuck. And I don't know why I don't have hobbies. I don't know. I, oh, it just sounds so hard. I have a whole hobby stuff you do. Like, oh. <laughs> Thank you. So I was wondering what other uh, kinds of less obvious manly things you might have looked into, um, such as, you know, the obvious things are like doing the army training and riding a bull and whatever. But some of the less obvious things, like maybe uh, the leader of a, of, a, of a boat crew that goes crab fishing in Alaska, or yeah, doing something on. like raising money and building a startup company or something like that, and what it <laughs> takes to, obviously something we're near and dear to us. So I'm curious about those experiences. Yeah, so I sold this as a movie. I was, uh, 
I was supposed to write it and I haven't, so I'm now writing it with another guy. And we were sitting around yesterday making a list of things that I considered that we might put in the movie. And I, we cons I considered Alaskan king crab fishing, which is super manly. Uh, in the end, I decided I simply wanted to have the skills of your average American male, which I, def I define pretty, I think in America we define masculinity by this very Scotch-Irish, Sir Walter Raleigh, um, south of the Mason-Dixon line, Hatfields and McCoys, kind of very specific masculinity. Uh, and that's what I was, I was trying to do an average American does that fits into that. I also did the day trading thing, which is a very different Northeastern. And I, try, I was thinking about doing a British stiff upper lip, um, you know, drinking tea while the bombs were falling kind of manliness. Uh, didn't really accomplish that. So I really stuck to that Southern American masculinity. So I, so, and all the things I considered along the lines you're talking about seemed very extreme and different than like, I spent a day with the firefighters for the book, which seemed within the realm of what an average dude might be able to do. Whereas like hella logging, I thought about uh, having a coyote uh, let me cross the border from Mexico. I thought about doing a couple days in prison. I thought about uh, joining a biker gang uh, or going to Sturgis at least. And I thought about uh, selling uh, crack. Um, <laughs> what else? I had, a, I had a really long, and then I thought the one th there were a couple of things I didn't do just because people didn't call me back. And uh, like the Hell's Angels have a really <laughs> bad website. I don't know if you guys can fix that, but they don't really, they don't re respond to their user questions. Uh, yeah, and I, I, some things I got pretty far with, some things I didn't cut from the book, like I actually wound up cutting all the stuff about, um, I spent a day at a hedge fund I cut, I uh, spent three days in the, as a pit crew in this um, race that I cut. Um, I got pretty far with spending, I wanted to spend like a couple weeks just occasionally at night with the Elks or the Lions or any of those groups, just like old dudes talking about old stories, I thought would be something very masculine about that part of your life. There's, there was really an endless amount of stuff I could do. I like, thought about farming, thought about being a cowboy. Uh, so yeah, there was, there was really an endless amount of stuff I could do. I probably, I wish I'd done fewer things actually and really focused more on the depth of it, but uh, I'm a lazy writer. Thanks. You guys have no work to do. That's what I'm learning. <laughs> um, of all the different like themes and, and pieces that you researched and written about, one, what made you choose kind of this to start writing a book? Um, and then, after this whole experience, do you think there's like more in the future? Are you interested in doing kind of these more in-depth like pieces and stories and books and maybe I guess movies later? Yeah, you know, I. So after I started at Time, part of the reason I took that job was so I could write a book. And I had one idea that was okay that no one wanted to buy early on. And then I hadn't really had an idea I liked enough to pursue as a book. And, and to be totally frank, like, I'm not sure this was that idea. <laughs> it's just that uh, the book industry was dying and I felt like I had to write a book. And this was something that I organically was talking about and feeling and eventually my friend Josh was like, you should write a book where you learn to be a man. Like if you're so obsessed with this, like just go do it. So it was an opportunity for me to do a lot of things that I wanted to have done, but wouldn't do unless I had a reason, because they all sucked. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of how I decided to write the book. I don't know, I don't know if that's the best way to decide to write a book. I, if I were to write another book, I don't know. I don't know if I would do it the same way. I, if I did do it the same way, I know what I would write about, which is, um, I don't know if I could describe quickly, but basically, I probably won't write this book. I'll probably have to do a new genre of book because I think this genre of going to do stuff is getting a little old, at least for now. But if I were to go do stuff again, I'm kind of curious about the fact that 98% of the decisions that we make in life uh, aren't really our decisions. We just do what, because it's only practical to do it this way. We do what our society and our friends are doing. So most of the decisions I've made about how to live my life um, are really demographic and not the thought out choices I would think. So I wanted to go explore both historically and uh, in present time with different cultures, how people live their lives and go do that for a while. <coughs> like it's as simple as living in a foreign country for a couple months um, or having my family, my parents and my wife's parents live with us for a few months as people do in most of the world always have done. Just kind of like exploring, getting super religious for a while, just like exploring different ways to live and seeing and kind of making more thoughtful choices. 
I realized that didn't sound funny, but it'd be really funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Thanks for having me. This is fun.